SIM stands for Substrate Independent Minds. It's the notion that you can take the functions that are going on inside of our brain that produce mind and have them carried out in different kinds of implementations, just like you could have computing code running on different types of platforms. And uh, it relates closely to two other terms. It relates to the concept of mind uploading, which means taking the functions of the mind and moving them to another substrate. And it relates to a specific approach, the most conservative one that we have currently called whole brain emulation, the notion that you need to actually emulate the mechanisms, the functions of neurophysiology and neuroanatomy at a detailed level to get mind functions to work. Um, well, there, it's not really a strict difference. Uh, this is a matter of how we choose to use the terminology in this field. Uh, and because we like to make a distinction, we make this distinction using the words simulation and emulation, where by simulation we mean building a model that is a general model of how some piece of mind somewhere could work. So it's an average of what you would find in different animals or different people. Whereas an emulation is a very specific reconstruction of neural circuitry such that you get the, uh, the same function, you get the same exact uh, activity that you would find in a specific case, in, in one specific piece of circuitry. Well, it's really that we don't have a choice at the moment. We don't have the choice to use a non-conservative approach because we don't understand enough about the higher levels of mental functioning to be able to do something like a top-down approach or to create models of mind that are very optimized, that contain different converted versions of how mental functions could be implemented. All we have right now is 100 years of neuroscience looking at the very bottom levels, looking at what types of neurons are there, what types of synapses are there, how do you identify them, how do you measure from them. That's the kind of information that we have that's the sort of knowledge we can use. That's why the most conservative approach. Uh, on the one hand, it'll help make a difference in understanding what we find in the brain, because being able to reconstruct the circuitry there is still a step removed from understanding what that circuitry is doing. The understanding step will be aided by all that knowledge that we acquire in those decades. On the other hand, knowing more about the brain in that sense and having better tools will also allow us to make better implementations of mental functions. We'll be able to come up with more efficient solutions and solutions that are able to do more. It's also an exploratory problem. It's again, it's this question of uh, we have a system that's fairly unknown and uh, we want to draw a line around it somewhere and say this is the part we're going to describe because we think that's the one that contains the interesting effects. And then if you find that this hasn't captured the interesting effects, there are two areas you can look. You can look at the resolution. Maybe you're not including enough of the signals that you should be looking at. Or maybe you're not including enough of the scope. Maybe you're not taking into account as much as you should be taking into account. So maybe we should be doing uh, simulations of the cerebral cortex plus the spinal cord plus the nervous system in our gut. But um, possibly no. I think it's a good place to start to just say, let's look at the brain, the part that is inside of our head, and, and look at uh, simple signals like spikes to begin with, and then work from there. Yeah, we really don't know yet how precise that resolution needs to be. All we know is that the brain has a certain resolution because we have individual neurons. We don't just have big clusters that are indistinguishable uh, where something's happening. So there is a probability that all of these individual neurons and what they're doing separately counts, that it matters. Uh, so my tendency would be to think that it is a good idea to get down to that resolution. But we really don't know. It might be that we can just treat clusters as a single unit. That's really a big problem. And as I describe in my talks, this is a matter of, of grasping structure and of grasping function. And the structural part uh, is something that I think we'll be able to solve much sooner than the functional one, because there are many more tools appearing these days to deal with what we call connectomics, being able to acquire the morphology of the system and the structure, the connections, that, the connections between all the different neurons. 
Um, on the functional side, we're not that good yet. We can get a global idea of activity in the system at a low resolution using devices like MRI, or we can look at a sort of pinpricks within the system by taking electrode readings uh, at various locations. And then there are a few new technologies such as something called a molecular ticker tape or wireless neural probes that are being developed that should be able to give us a much higher resolution and be able to register from many more neurons at the same time. But these don't exist yet. These are in development, though if I've understood correctly, the first versions of the molecular ticker tape have just become available for testing, so that should be really interesting. Oh, I think this is all happening within the next five to ten years. That's, it's uh, happening really quickly because a lot of the attention in the tool building area of neuroscience is being focused on that now because it's very clear among those people who understand this problem and understand about system identification and neural circuitry that we have a lot of the tools we need for structure although those can still be improved and perfected and we need way more in the area of functional recording so this is happening very quickly and it includes developments that we've seen over the past couple of years like the development of optogenetics where it makes it possible to select specifically which neurons are on and which are off so that you know which ones you'll be recording from. Well this is the same as with the question of resolution in cells. Uh, again we really don't know. Uh, it's a matter of finding out, of empirically testing this. So you start with a model that assumes something, so we either assume that we need all of them and then we try to map them all in a small piece of neural circuitry, or we assume that we can just measure the strength of connectivity between two neurons and represent that as a single connection, no matter how many synapses are actually there, and use that. And I think we're going to be testing both of those approaches and see which one works best. There are actually a number of these projects now. Uh, there's the big one in Europe, that's true, and there are a few others that are popping up, although some of them aren't funded just as well. I think it's just a sign of the fact that the, the connectome, is, uh, which really just came into, uh, into the general understanding of, of what neuroscience, that this was a topic back in 2008. That was the first time it really popped up. So this isn't that long ago, but four years later, it's a hot topic everywhere, and everyone wants to develop tools and extract data and understand more about the human connectome and represent it. Uh, one thing that I find a bit of a problem is that because it's a hot topic and because it means that funding is going into it, people jump on the bandwagon who are changing the definition of what the connectome is. When the connectome was originally approached, it meant getting all of the detailed ultrastructure of the brain and where the dendrites head, where the axons go and where the synapses are. But now there are a lot of projects that do things like diffusion tensor F MRI, which is really just a way of looking at large pathways, looking at large bundles of nerves that are heading through the brain. So it's not the same resolution at all, and that's also being called connectomics. I guess that may also be useful, but it is diverting some of the funds that should really be used for the more ultrastructure work. There are very many things in the last 10 years that have moved us closer and they re relate directly to the different parts of what we call the roadmap for whole brain emulation. So we already talked a little bit about data acquisition on the structural side and the functional side and we see that in, on the structural side where the connectome is concerned a lot has happened even just over the past five years. Um, on the functional side a lot is happening right now. Now the rest of the roadmap if we look at what's needed there so, for example, computation, uh, emulation platforms, things like neuromorphic hardware. We see that a lot has happened there as well. You've seen big programs appear like the DARPA Synapse project, project which is specifically about creating a, neuro, uh, sorry, a, a neuromorphic chip, something that would work in a similar fashion as neurons do. Um, and then on the other side, when it comes to doing experiments and testing hypotheses, over the past few years we've seen increasingly detailed models of uh, neural circuitry. So for example in 2011 there was this wonderful set of papers by Brigman et al. and Bock et al. that showed at the ultrastructure level that you can reconstruct something and then say something about function. So it's really a proof of concept of whole brain emulation. And we've also seen work being carried out in the neuroprosthetic area. So you take, for example, Ted Berger's work, which has certainly been going on over the entire span of the last decade, 
and has been figuring out how to do system identification in neural tissue and create chips that carry out the same function as the tissue that used to be there. So we've seen work in the hypothesis testing area, how do you build these models. We've seen work in the, uh, in the emulation sphere, so making platforms on which it could run. And we've seen work on the data acquisition side. We haven't seen as much work in the last 10 years on integrating all of those things, but I guess it's only natural that that happens last, that that's one of the things we get to now. Uh, symposium that I've organized uh, in conjunction with the um, annual meeting of the Society for Neuroscience which is being held in New Orleans this year, uh, so this is in October, is specifically about that. We're trying to gather the people working on these different projects and talk about integration of their data. And we're taking this forward also by, re uh, by presenting all of the parts of the roadmap and the main players in it at the uh, 2045 Global Futures, uh, Global Future Congress that's going to be happening in New York City in 2013. And those are just some examples of efforts that we're making to do this integration step. But of course, that's really the main work of carboncopies.org, is keeping track of a roadmap, understanding the big picture, and dealing with the integration of various projects.